On December 7th, 1941, just before 8 a.m. Hawaiian Aleutian Standard Time, Japan unleashed a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. The Japs copied their German masters in striking hard at airfields. Hickam Field, northwest of Honolulu, and the Ford Island Naval Plane Base were the first objectives of Japan's treachery. Scores of planes were bruised and battered by the Japs' aerial bombs. Many of these were demolished beyond repair. Hundreds of Japanese aircraft descended on the naval base, destroying nearly 20 American Navy vessels and killing roughly 2,400 Americans. At 4.10 p.m. on December 8th, President Franklin Roosevelt signed the U.S. Congress Joint Resolution and declared war on Japan. The United States had officially joined the Second World War. The U.S., alongside the Allied powers such as France, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union, fought against the Axis powers, who consisted of Germany, Italy, and Japan. The U.S. fought World War II in two main ways. First, the U.S. initiated a mass mobilization effort. Millions of men and women went to serve overseas. Those who couldn't took up work at home. The battle was not only external, but also internal. The second way the U.S. fought was by removing all potential spies. White Americans feared another deadly bombing, so they turned to their fellow Japanese Americans and questioned their loyalty to the U.S. Following the bombing of Pearl Harbor, anti-Japanese sentiment skyrocketed throughout the United States. White Americans vandalized Japanese stores and shops. Harsher working conditions pushed them out of their jobs and racism in schools and public environments forced them to stay in their homes. On February 19, 1942, following the growing distrust toward Japanese Americans, President Roosevelt enacted Executive Order 9066, which allowed the alienation and segregation of Japanese Americans. The executive order had more immediate ramifications. The executive order permitted the mass incarceration of Japanese Americans by reallocating them to internment camps. Those who did not comply were evicted from their homes and their assets were frozen. World War II developed into war on skin color and ethnicity. If you were Japanese, you did not belong in America anymore. You could not live in your homes, you could not go to school, and you could not be American. You were an enemy. When the US authorized Executive Order 9066, only a few Nisei or older immigrants left. The US grew fearful that the Japanese Americans would not leave, so they forced the Japanese Americans to move by freezing their financial assets. Here is Paul Tomita, a survivor of the Japanese internment camps, to talk more about the situation. Some of us were given hours to, to get rid of all our possessions, our businesses, our homes, our cars, our refrigerators, our animals. We couldn't even take our animals with us. There were several cases where Japanese Americans fought against discrimination and the executive law. For many, this meant staying in houses, active protest, or using their voices. One specific case is Fred Korematsu, who in 1942 refused to go to a Japanese prison camp. The case went all the way to the Supreme Court, where he claimed that Executive Order 9066 violated the Fifth Amendment. At the end, he lost his case, but his active protest inspired many. Any protests at this time were fruitless, and eventually Japanese Americans had to move. The planned internment camps had not been built yet, so the U.S. looked for another way to remove the Japanese Americans. The U.S. put Japanese Americans into assembly centers. There were 12 assembly centers in California, one in Washington, one in Oregon, and one in Arizona. Assembly centers were not built to store humans. They were often racetracks or large compounds meant to hold livestock. 
The conditions were horrible. There was no privacy. Here is Paul Tomita to explain more. It was like a holding pen, you know, for animals. Japanese Americans were treated as livestock, so much so that they were stamped with digits, not names, to denote who they were. This is Paul's from when he was a child. The assembly centers, uh, they gave us numbers. Our, our last name is Tomita, T-O-M-I-T-A. After this, our, our name was 11940. We lost our last name. They stuck it on, you know, on us kids, you know, we kids like that. And everything that we took with us that we could carry had 11940. Japanese Americans spent an average of three months in these centers. Each center had stables where at one time 3,800 Japanese Americans were housed underneath one roof. In one assembly center called the Tonforan, stalls that were meant to house a maximum of one horse were now used to house three to six people. Multiple families would be squished into the same room. Each person was issued one blanket and one cotton mattress. The food was limited to the same repetitive meals, and the lack of medical attention led to an unhospitable environment. Japanese Americans had to work minimum wage in these camps by picking produce or farming. Most centers were surrounded by wired fences and watchtowers. Each center had a strict curfew at night and an early roll call in the morning. Policemen could enter any family room without a warrant and there were inspections daily. Army regulations required that all meetings be conducted in English with as little Japanese as possible. Though it would be wrong to say that the assembly centers restricted every freedom. In many cases, there were looser restrictions on Japanese Americans practicing religion educating themselves, and playing around together. Confinement of the assembly centers resembled the soon-to-come internment camps. After a couple of months, these assembly centers would soon be empty. Around May 26, 1942, there was another mass mobilization movement. Japanese Americans were sent off to inland concentration camps. Many believed that the assembly centers were the end. Rather, they went to unfinished barracks. These internment camps were not fully built, and oftentimes, the Japanese Americans had to help build the confinement themselves. The camps were in mostly deserts without any connection to the outside world. Each camp had a mess hall, a school, a hospital, barracks, bathrooms, and laundry facilities. In Chizu's case, the Japanese Americans in her camps were separated into barracks. Each room had five people. Sometimes her family would be sleeping with a total stranger. Every room had khaki army blankets and was illuminated by one light bulb. The flimsy barracks were put up so quickly that many times Japanese Americans had to rebuild their own walls. In Paul's case, his barracks were made up of tar paper and wood and were almost useless against the dusty winds. Even worse, the weather was terrible. In the summers, it was incredibly hot and temperatures would reach up to 150 degrees Fahrenheit. During the winters, the temperature would easily go below freezing. The only thing to provide you heat in those winters would be stoves inside each of the barrack rooms. What was worse was that everything was public. Bathrooms, washrooms, meal rooms, and even barracks had almost no separators. You could hear every word from one family to another. There was no privacy. Environment to be taken, you know, from nice Southern California to a desert in the middle of nowhere, it seemed. And um, 
our camp was not finished yet, so it was quite dusty. Dusty is an understatement. In many cases in these camps, parents had to cover their children's mouth with cloth in order to prevent dust inhalation. Dust anywhere there was ho- there were holes. The dust came through. The dust came through the sides. The dust came through the roof. The dust even came from the the boards underneath. When my parents found out, and my parents thought, "Oh, well, this is where we're going to be." The first thing they said is, "Paul Jr. because my father's name is Paul. Paul Jr. is going to die here, you know." And 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 they they said, "He he is. He'll be the first to die here." Furthermore, the security was hell. Like the assembly centers, each camp was surrounded by wired fencing and watchtowers. There were eight guard towers, 30 feet high, and it was manned by machine guns and with searchlights. And essentially, what happens here is if the if the soldiers thought that we were were trying to escape. They had the right to shoot us, and there were incidences. In the internment camps, Japanese Americans were often treated unjustly, and were denied many human rights. Paul and Chizu were children when they were detained, and like 30,000 other Japanese American children, they needed education. No budget or plan had been set aside for these camps, so managing and creating an education facility was incredibly difficult. The schools had little supplies and were not managed very well. Each apartment of a school was like a prison cell, with only a couple of rooms packed with many children. Teachers were also hard to come by. In some cases, the student-to-teacher ratio was as high as 48 to one. Many rooms would be extremely hot in the summer and so cold in the winter. Even through mistreatment, Japanese Americans were able to keep their culture and tradition alive. There were Japanese Americans who still practiced religion, wrote in newspapers, and played games. The close-knit communities created a renewed love for fun activities. One was athletics. In Japanese internment communities, they often formed teams. Traded sports cards and founded athletic competitions like baseball. In these camps, Japanese Americans attempted to seek better treatment. 